let me welcome you again. My name is Brad Smith. I'm the President and Chief Legal Officer at Microsoft. Uh, and before I welcome and introduce Secretary Carter, uh, let me first say I think on behalf of all of us from the Seattle business community, the civic community, the philanthropic community, the education community, the public sector and governmental community, let us give a warm welcome to all of the military leaders we have with us here this morning. It is such a delight to have all of you with us, uh, in particular those of you who have important leadership roles at the bases here in the region. Uh, we know that your service and your leadership is not only vital for the nation, but it's important for our state. And so one of the ideas we had in bringing the secretary here was an opportunity to get us all together so we'd have more of an opportunity to meet. So, I think we're making some good progress on that, which is terrific. But of course, the main attraction is the 25th Secretary of Defense, <laughs> Ashton Carter. It is a slight exaggeration to say that he has more degrees than the first 24 Secretaries of Defense <laughs> put together, but it's only a slight exaggeration. Uh, when he was an undergraduate at Yale, he managed to major in both physics and medieval history. I don't know how much those two intersected, but they're two really interesting disciplines. And he went on from that to being a Rhodes Scholar, studying theoretical physics at Oxford. He's had a distinguished career in so many respects. Uh, he's an individual who has been an academic leader at both the Kennedy School at Harvard on the East Coast and the Hoover Institution at Stanford on the West Coast. Uh, he has published 11 books and over 100 articles, and he has been connected in a variety of ways with the Department of Defense throughout his career. From 1993 to 1996, he served as an Assistant Secretary of Defense, where he had important responsibilities for our strategic and defense policy issues. Then he rejoined the Department of Defense in 2009. He was uh, first an undersecretary, then he served as deputy secretary, really the COO for the entire department and the three million members of our military. And since 2013, he has been the 25th Secretary of Defense. He's gonna share uh, some opening remarks. We'll have a Q&A, we'll open it up to questions. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Carter. Thanks, Brad. Thank Appreciate it. Thank, th thank you so much, Brad, and thank all of you. Thank all of you for being here. Um, this is the way it ought to be. The military community and the larger community together, um, the security imperative and our competitive and technological imperatives coming together, reinforcing uh, one another. So uh, this meeting, which was Microsoft's idea, and I really salute you, uh, for it. I'm grateful to have the opportunity. It signifies everything we need to do uh, to protect our people and make a better world for our children. So I thank you all for how, what you do every day in, in that cause individually, but for coming together uh, today. Governor, thank you for being here. Honor us with your presence. And uh, I, 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 for our, what I call our folks, uh, our, 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 our family, uh, everybody just looking out here at our guys in uniform, I just have to say that uh, people say, what, well, what's it like to be Secretary of Defense? You know, you have all these burdens, you have all these responsibilities. I said, no, no look, at, look how proud you are, I can be of these people. I am so proud to be the Secretary of Defense for our military. And Steve, I want to call out just one, one, one guy who's here who I go back with a ways, which Steve Lanza, we were just talking now, I go back to Iraq, back, back in another cycle, and he did absolutely amazing things there and now holds down a major part of our responsibility here. And our responsibility here is the topic about which I, I thought I'd make a few remarks and then we're going to do, Brad's going to uh, ask some questions and then we'll, I'll take questions or a comment uh, from anybody uh, out there. Um, 
the theme is the importance of the bond between the U.S. military and our fellow citizens in so many domains. It's not something we can take for granted. Uh, as generations change, as technology changes, as society changes. And uh, people are, I know, uh, and they tell me all the time, are very grateful for what those folks do uh, for our country. The, they know that it's the finest fighting force the world has ever known. They're glad of that. Uh, but they also expect that it'll stay that way 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And I have the responsibility of fighting today's wars and also making sure that we can dominate tomorrow's security landscape. Earlier this week, I gave a speech down in San Francisco about the role that the Defense Department plays in ensuring the security of the global marketplace upon which Seattle depends. I was in San Francisco at the time, San Francisco depends. And we do this, we do it in every domain, air, land, sea, space, cyberspace. And we do it so companies like Microsoft and the others represented in this room can do what they do best, helping empower people through technology and helping our people reach their full potential. This is a role that America and its military, this global role, have had since the end of World War II. It's one we continue to fulfill today, and it's one we intend to continue to fulfill, even as we enter what it really is a new strategic era, engaging with a security environment that's dramatically different from the last 25 years. Let me give you a sense of what we're focused on these days in the Pentagon. There are no fewer than five central evolving, central challenges that drive our planning now in the Defense Department, our planning, our budgeting, our activities, our operations, namely Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and terrorism. And I want to briefly describe each of them to you this morning before I go more deeply into the issues that I know are top of mind for this community. The first two of those challenges, China and Russia, reflect <laughs> in a way a return to great power competition. One is in Europe, where we're taking a strong, have to take a strong and balanced approach to deterring Russian aggression on the continent of the kind we've seen. Second challenge is in the Asia Pacific the single most consequential region of the world to America's future. Half of humanity, half of the economy, only growing. Where China's rising, which is fine, but behaving aggressively, which is not. <coughs> Meanwhile, two other long-standing challenges pose threats in sp to specific regions. North Korea is one. And that's why our forces, and we never take our eye off of this, our forces on the Korean Peninsula remain ready, as their slogan goes, to fight tonight. Not something we want to do, but something we're ready to do. And the other is Iran. Because while the nuclear accord is a good deal in preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, we must still deter Iranian aggression and check Iranian malign influence in the region and protect allies and friends, including especially Israel. The fifth challenge, very different from the four, and critically important, is our ongoing fight against terrorism, especially ISIL, which must be and will be dealt a lasting defeat. Most immediately, in its parent tumor in Iraq and Syria, where we're accelerating our campaign in every dimension, including cyber, by the way, as well as where ISIL is metastasizing around the world. We're doing it in North Africa. We're also doing that in Afghanistan, where we continue to stand with the Afghan government and people to counter ISIL and Al-Qaeda. And at the same time, all the while, we're continuing to work with other government agencies on protecting our homeland and protecting our people here. We don't have the luxury of choosing among these five challenges. We have to deal with them all. But we do have the ability to set a course for the future, a future that's uncertain but that'll certainly be competitive and demanding of America's leadership 
our values, our military edge. The forces and capabilities we have based here in the Pacific Northwest are and continue to be a critical part of that. And the ships and submarines that patrol the seas ensure the free flow of commerce to the cyber mission forces that help protect and defend networks online and the troops and airmen who are building and strengthening in our relationship with our many friends and allies in the Asia Pacific. There are our military is the greatest first and foremost because of the people. The people represented here and the people they lead. Uh, the, that's why we have all the friends and allies around the world and our antagonists don't. People like to work with our <laughs> folks. They like to work with American soldiers. They conduct themselves decently. They're competent. They like, they like working with them. And they like the values that America stands for. And that's attractive. And the, that, those people and those values are two of the things that make our military the greatest. But the third is and has been for decades and decades technology, the strength of our connection to technology and innovation. And we need to innovate. We need to do it, do it together uh, uh, for the future. Uh, because that's the way to make sure that we have the finest fighting force in the world tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So one of my core goals as Secretary of Defense has been to build and to rebuild bridges between the Pentagon and communities like Seattle and San Francisco and Boston and many others, all places where companies like yours, ones represented in this room, continue to thrive and innovate and benefit our society and our security. And I'm going to be actually visiting some of them while I'm out here. I visited some yesterday. I'm especially grateful to Microsoft for building that bridge from the other direction. From your per public service sabbatical, this is a big deal, by the way, program, public service sabbatical program, I encourage others to do the same thing. High-level engagement between DOD leaders and your CEO, Satya Nadella, which I'm very grateful for and now here today through connections at the community level. We need partners like Microsoft and the others in this room because I always tell people we don't build anything in the Pentagon. That's not the American way. Soviet Union tried that, didn't work out very well for them. We have the best technology because we have a connection to the most innovative technology community in the world, that's why. And that's been true for decades, and it's still true, but the context is changing. When I began my career in this business, most technology of consequence came from America. And much of that from the government. Now, American technology is still strong, and the government investment, $72 billion a year in our case this, this coming year, is still strong. But there's no question the global technology base is commercialized and globalized compared to when I started out. That's a very different uh, environment uh, within which we have to keep an innovative defense. So to make sure that our military stays the best in a changing and competitive world, we're investing aggressively in innovation un from everything, undersea drones, cybersecurity, missiles that can fly five times the speed of sound, things I, we, we're, we, we don't talk about because we want them to be surprising uh, to anybody who tries anything with us. We're doing a lot. One important place we're investing is cybersecurity. Like so many bis businesses here, we in the Defense Department rely abjectly on network security. None of our stuff works. The planes, ships, tanks, soldiers, and everything, they need the network to uh, be effective. So defending our networks and our weapon systems is job one for me in the cyber area. They're no good if they've been hacked. And here, I have to say Microsoft has been a great partner to DOD. Uh, we're making a department-wide transition over the next year to the much more secure Windows 10 operating system. This is a, a, very, a big deal. It's unprecedented for both DOD and I believe for Microsoft mm -hmm. as well. And it means that four million desktops, laptops, and tablets will be better equipped inherently to defend themselves against cyber threats. 
and I'm looking forward later today to seeing how Microsoft is pushing the envelope in cyber defenses when I visit its new cybersecurity operations center later today. As DOD makes these investments, we're also doing more to connect with America's innovative business and technology community. For example, last year I opened a defense innovation hub in Silicon Valley and plan to do more, by the way, to explore ways we can better partner with companies here on the West Coast, essentially an outpost of the Pentagon on the West Coast. There's also our new defense digital service, uh, which brings coders in for what we call a tour of duty. They come in, these are talented people uh, who think they want to do something that matters, something of consequence, go home and tell their family that they did something that's bigger than themselves, uh, the noblest thing they could do. And they come in, you know, they're not going to make a career of it, they're not going to join, they're not going to be part of the government, uh, but they come in for a year or a two or a project and make a contribution to us. Uh, and the leader of the Defense Digital, so Chris, where are you? Right over here, that's Chris Lynch over there, is, the is, is my head of the Defense Digital Service. I brought him uh, with me. He's been a serial entrepreneur in the tech world, uh, living in Seattle, actually, for a time, even spent some time at Microsoft. Um, and since Chris has been with us, he and his team have solved some really important problems for us. I'll give you just one example of one thing they, uh, they dived in and took on, uh, and that is improving data sharing between DOD and the VA uh, to make sure our veterans get access to their benefits. Uh, I mean, it may sound like something that we should have done right in the first place, but the reality is we didn't. And uh, Chris and his team came in there, cracked people, turned the whole thing around in a few weeks. He's done such a good job cutting through red tape that he even gets to look like that in the Pentagon. Stand up, Chris. He's the only guy in a hoodie in the Pentagon every day. And that's not all we're doing. Yesterday, I announced two other <laughs> important initiatives. One is that DOD is going to invite vetted hackers to test our cybersecurity under a unique pilot called Hack the Pentagon. This is similar to the bug bounties that Microsoft and other companies have, and it'll be the first one ever in the entire federal government. And the objective here is to let the white hats help us find vulnerabilities before the black hats do. They do it for free, they do it for sport, they do it for the distinction of having done it. I hope they don't succeed. Uh, but if they succeed, we'll learn something. It's a great idea of borrowing best practices from the outside world where they can apply to us and using them to improve ourselves. Another initiative uh, is that I'm creating a new defense innovation board to advise me on how to remain innovative in the Defense Department, how to build that bridge to the technology community, how to look at ourselves in the mirror and see how can we change to be more competitive, take advantage. And we'll always be different, right? We're the profession of arms. It's never going to be the same. It's not a company. Uh, it's the military. But that doesn't mean we can't learn things uh, from people uh, who have been innovative outside. I'm very pleased that Eric Schmidt uh, from Google's parent company, Alphabet, has agreed to chair the Defense Innovation Board for me. And I hope we'll see some innovators from the Seattle area joining that board as well. They'll advise me and those who come after me on how DOD can better connect to innovation and make better use of it, including, as I said, changing ourselves where that's appropriate. I often say that we in the Pentagon, and I really mean this, have to think outside of our five-sided box. I want to make sure there's enough time for me to answer your questions. Let me close by saying, the obvious, uh, really, which is this is a tremendous ex uh, a time of, of, of excitement, uh, not just because of the dangers we face, uh, which I'm confident we'll overcome because we have the resolve and the strength and the will and the force to do so, uh, but uh, because it reminds of a different era um, and one we can replicate, the kind of collaboration between companies, the government, academia, that built the internet and GPS, and I remember those days, or in an earlier era, communication satellites, the jet engine. I have to say I don't remember that. <laughs> I do remember the others. 
For those interested in foreign policy and national security, there are lots and lots of interesting challenges and problems for you to work on. That's also true for those interested in technology. The intersection of the two is an opportunity-rich environment for the innovative mind. These issues matter. It's not a game. This is about our protection and our security and creating a world in which our citizens can wake up in the morning, hug their kids, take them to school, go to work, dream their dreams, live their lives. That's what it's all about. But you can't do that if you don't have security. It's our job to provide that. And to do that well now and in the future, we have to keep thinking, we have to keep changing, we have to keep challenging ourselves. And for those who are inclined to join this noble enterprise in one way or another, I just say the way I feel myself, which is that helping to defend your country and make a better world is one of the noblest things that you can spend your time doing. I'm grateful to all of you in this community who directly and indirectly do that with me. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Let me kick it off. Uh, you, you know, you've spent the last two days in San Francisco in Silicon Valley talking uh, there with folks as uh, you are this morning and today with us here about some of these issues. Um, what kind of reception are you getting? What are you hearing from companies and individuals as you raise these issues? Generally, very receptive, and uh, and here's the reason: uh, people in the innovative uh, sector are there for a reason. They like to do things of consequence. Yeah. They want to make a difference. They want to do things that matter. And if you can acquaint them with the problems that we face, they recognize these things matter. And that's a huge magnet. The mission all by itself is a big magnet. Now, at the same time, they will represent to me some of the obstacles that I'm intent upon uh, eliminating. And you, you, you know what they are. Uh, it can be difficult to work with the government as a company because we can be clunky and we can be bureaucratic and so forth, and we need to get better at that. Uh, we have the whole Snowden overhang, no question about it. Uh, and um, we have uh, issues where th the business interests uh, need to be taken into account as we make our foreign policy decisions and so forth. And, and we, I, my view is I, we, we need to have that dialogue uh, because it's the unity that makes the country stronger. So to me, it's entirely a two-way street. And I don't, I don't try to um, tell people what the solutions are. These are things that we need to figure out together. We need to innovate together for the future. And I've, I, I find that the idea of partnership and a true two-way street is very attractive to innovative people. I was struck when Satya and I had the chance to talk with you in January, and you put all of this in the context of the way the relationship and dialogue between the military and the American public has sort of changed over time, over the course of decades. Could you share a little bit of that? Yeah, I think it, it, it has changed, and that's why having the community and our community, our military community together as they are in this room is so important. It, we have to recognize, and I certainly recognize, that it, two generations ago, everybody had fought in World War II. Everybody had some acquaintance, some connection. And then there was a generation where everybody had a dad or had an uncle or something, and they had some way of connecting in a human way to the mission. And uh, it was a reflex of the technology community. The way I, the way I was brought up by the, the people who are a generation leaders in physics, mm -hmm. a generation uh, 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 older than me, had all been, some of them had been part of the, the older ones, had been part of the Manhattan Project and the Cold War, and they, they all knew, they'd all worked with the government. They knew the importance of innovation, so it was kind of in the blood, and they, and they, they inculcated in me the idea that y with your knowledge comes an obligation. To contribute, and that was a little spark that got me into the thing in the whole first place. In the first place, well, I, we just have to recognize that those conditions aren't the same. 
now, and so we have to reach out more. That's why I'm so intent when it comes to recruiting new people that we are able to reach into all parts of the population. Mm -hmm. That people say, why did you? Why do you want to have women who are qualified? Women who qualified meet standards. I just want to have the other half of the population available to me, and it doesn't stop there. We are not as we don't we don't recruit effectively in all the regions of the country equally. I, we know that we're mm -hmm. trying to do that better. It's an all-volunteer force. So, and we, we get to pick the best. But the reality is that most young Americans don't meet our qualifications. And so we have to be able to pick and choose and we have to reach into the whole qualified pool in order to get the very best. Then you have to retain people. And people have choices in today's world. It's not the old world, the old, people don't, they don't think about their lives the same way where you get on the escalator and wait for it to go up. They want to go around in a jungle gym and get, around, get up by getting around. And you have to take that into account. Generations change. Kids are different from me. I, and I have to understand that. And our leaders need to understand that they're going to be different and we need to understand where they're coming from. So the whole, and I talked about globalization, commercialization, the, the climate's changed. Uh, to me, that doesn't mean we can't have as strong a bond. We're just going to do it in a different way. And uh, so, but it's very important that we keep reaching out to our society, to our young people generationally, and here uh, to the technology community. And I'm so grateful for communities like the greater Seattle area and the whole state governor for uh, the gracious way in which our people are treated and hosted. It's a wonderful, it's a great, it's the way it ought to be. These are relatively early days for your initiatives, bringing more young people in in different kinds of ways, projects, as you said. Um, what are you learning? What are you finding? What is the uh, reaction of, of young people as they come in? Uh, uh, the first is, show me a way I can do this, that I can give this a try. Hmm. And, you know, that's the mentality of young people now. I'll give it a try. I'm not going to sign up to Ford Motor or sign up, you know, to, to, to I, I'll give it a try. So letting people give it a try is really important. And, uh, uh, once they do that and they feel the gravity of it, and you get to go home and you tell your spouse, you get to tell your kids, you get to tell your parents, that's what I did all day. That's really attractive. So if we can catch them, if we can just get them for a little while, give us, give us a, a, a try. And then, you know, we have to <laughs> bend over backwards to uh, uh, look like an appealing place to work. Otherwise, people think we're an old institution, right? We've been around for 270 odd years or something. And people want to be part of something new. Well, there's a lot of what we do that is new, that's exciting, that's novel, uh, and so forth. And you got to so you got to ignite that spark, and then the flame goes. Now you say, what, what are we doing? I, I'm not done yet. We're going to keep trying.